six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Our country was ignited. We were going to make it to the moon, and we were going to do it first, even though we started off a little behind. That kind of effort, that kind of laser locked on to our target goals, whether it's getting to the moon or solving the cancer problems, and I use plural because we know this is many diseases, but they are related. I've always honestly considered myself an engineer first, uh, essentially a bioengineer. Our professors at Purdue have, done, have taken it further, have done wonderful work in the area, and there's no question Purdue is the forefront of research, whether it's aeronautics, physics, biology, or cancer research and pharmaceuticals. Purdue clearly brings the kind of laboratories that bring both the intelligence, the academic capability, but also the practical ability to conduct these experiments, work with medical institutions. The team as a whole is the kind of team that got us to the moon. And I believe we need a moonshot in this country to cure cancer. It's personal. But I know we can do this because there are so many breakthroughs just on the horizon. There is every reason to believe Purdue will again be not only the cradle of astronauts, but it'll be the cradle of the solutions to the cancer problems. Cancer has to be beat. It must be beat. It's touched all of our lives. After this interview, I'm going to go visit a friend of mine. He's very sick. He has one of the cancers that must be beat. And we will talk about the future and about the past. I've known this friend all of my life. And I'd like to be able to tell him that we will solve this. I applaud Purdue for taking such a big role in solving the cancer problems. It will change humanity forever, the kind of work going on at Purdue right now. My name is Mike Pickett. I'm Director of Community Relations here at Purdue, and it's my pleasure, indeed it's my honor, to be here to moderate the program this afternoon. We're gathered here today because our nation is faced with an issue that has touched us all. The President and the Vice President have called on the nation to come together to do something extraordinary, to work together to end cancer as we know it, to double the progress that's been made. Cancer Moonshot Summits are being hosted in over 270 organizations nationwide today, including 30 cancer centers. Vice President Biden spoke to the nation just this morning and made a plea for all of us to work together to quicken our pace. Well, just as Purdue has played a lead role in putting a man on the moon, Purdue is also playing a leading role in discovering new ways to prevent, to diagnose, and to treat cancer. We'd like to take a moment before we get deeply into the program to welcome some special guests who are with us today. Brian Hannon, the Indiana Government Relations Director for the American Cancer Society Action Network. And Craig Svensson, the Dean of the College of Pharmacy and the Interim Dean of the College of Science here at Purdue University. Welcome to both of you. And I really want to welcome a very special guest on my left. He knows firsthand that dreams can come true. It takes hard work and perseverance, but it's certainly possible, and he's done it. Will you please welcome our fellow Boilermaker and friend, NASA astronaut David Wolf. David? <laughs> you should have a mic right over there. Pick up one of those microphones. And while Hello? you do that, I want to thank you for being with us today. But uh, we saw from the beginning of that video Come on, you handled spacewalks. You can handle this there's, microphone. There's no buttons on this thing, and I can't work it. You're working. Dev, it's going. It's good. Thanks very much, Mike. Congratulations. Well, we 
we saw in the video, you certainly have a personal interest in, uh, in the cancer situation that we're dealing with, and, and uh, also you have great confidence in Purdue's role. I do. Uh, a few words. Uh, thank you for letting me make a few comments earlier on the tape. This is a problem that's bigger than any one of us, any one institution, and it's very much like when we decided to build a space shuttle, build a space station, do the kind of work that we do up there. It takes the best minds coming together, and it's no accident that Purdue is heavily overrepresented at, at NASA. In fact, we're a pretty tight-knit group down there, and a pretty proud group. Um, this must be beat. We have to look back at this as a disease of the past. It's going to take the efforts of the very best, exactly the kind of thing that Purdue brings together. It's an effort at the level of the space program nationwide. It should ignite us with a passion for a better quality of life, the kind of passion that we were ignited to go to the moon. I love that this is happening, and it's even called a moonshot. There are so many similarities. So uh, it's just time for all of us to get on, of, on with it with the kind of collaborations that we know need put together and solve this group of diseases we call cancer that have some similarities. And, and um, just let's put those in the rearview mirror. You know, your time at Purdue surely gave you a, a feel for it because of the kind of things you did while you were here with, for the possibilities of what this university can do. Well, yes, it's obvious just uh, some engagement with Purdue and you know, we get to work with students and uh, of all levels from all over the world, literally, at NASA. And it's, it's, I can almost pick out a Purdue student <laughs> just after, I could have a drink at the drinking fountain with them. And I could say, you're from Purdue, aren't you? And he says, boy, they're up, right? <laughs> and they'll say yes, because uh, they are our best people. Um, I don't know if that answered what that you asked. That answers my but, question. <laughs> You know full well what this university is capable yeah, we, of. We have the energy and the power to do this and, and the multidisciplinary approach, whether it's nanotechnologies, the chemistry, the pharma pharmacies, uh, drug development, it goes on and on. The state also brings a lot to this. And we have IU Medical Center. Sorry, but it's going to be a good word in this, in this collaboration because we're going to, we're, they'll, they will synergize in a very powerful way. David, we certainly thank you very much for being here and for your role in this. And I, I want to make an announcement. It was actually the state made the announcement today, but on October the 12th, the torch that was going to that is going to celebrate our bicentennial and was developed right here at Purdue will be passing through this campus. And David Wolf will be carrying that torch, and he'll take it around the uh, Neil Armstrong statue and and uh, salute the state of Indiana on its 200th birthday. We look forward to that. Thanks for doing it. Now, to tell you more about how Purdue is leading this charge through the work at the Purdue Center for Cancer Research is Dr. Timothy Ratcliffe. Dr. Ratcliffe is the Robert Wallace Miller Director of the Purdue Center for Cancer Research and Distinguished Professor of Comparative Pathobiology. Dr. Ratcliffe, can you tell us a bit more about the center and then uh, some of the discoveries that are being made into cancer research here? Thank you, Mike. Uh, it's my privilege to uh, introduce you a little bit to the Center for Cancer Research and its leadership uh, in this Moonshot event. Uh, it's our intent to push our science forward in a way that's going to make this whole initiative a success so that it can stand beside landing on the moon as one of the major successes that we have. And what better place than this building uh, to launch it for us at Purdue. Uh, I have a few slides that I'll show you. and. Uh, try to introduce you to some of the things that we're doing. I think you'll be really excited. And then you'll hear from a number of our scientists who will uh, tell you even more about what we're doing. So this, uh, it's not that we haven't had success. We've had success. Uh, we have targeted therapy that enables us to treat cancers better than we've ever been able to treat them before. So targeted therapy really is aimed at hitting those pathways that make a cancer cell that really drive the cancer part of the cell. And if you think about your TV, you can think about what a driver pathway really is. 
So you sit there with your controls, and you're manipulating your TV, you're changing the channel, you're raising the volume. You think you're in control, but that, you're not the real driver. The real driver is the electricity. You unplug that baby, and it doesn't matter what you do with the control. Those cells are going to die. I mean, that's, the, that's what we're really targeting. That's what we're going after. And that's what we're able to do. And you can see a number of cancers that we've been able to treat a whole lot better. And we're getting close to being able to do even more. And I'll tell you a little bit about some of the things that Purdue's doing. Immunotherapy. Everyone in this audience has had the common cold, right? How do you get rid of that cold? There's no medication that you take. You depend on your body's defense mechanisms to reject that cold virus. Then you get well. You might take some Tylenol or something to control the fever. But the disease itself, your body has to get rid of it. And immunotherapy is just turning that body defense toward the cancer. But it's not so simple. That virus is foreign. So you can attack it easily. But a lung cancer cell is still a lung cell to your defense mechanism. So learning how to differentiate that has been a difficult process for us, but we're making tremendous advances in that right now. And I list a number of diseases that are being treated with immunotherapy now very successfully. Many of you have probably read about the former President Carter and him being cured of cancer, malignant melanoma. He was diagnosed with a brain metastasis, so it had spread to his brain, and that, three years ago, was the death sentence. He's now cured. There's really tremendous advances that we're making. And then finally, personalized medicine. What in the world does that mean? Well, you know, uh, the FDA approves drugs to treat lung cancer, to treat breast cancer, or prostate cancer, and that drug is used primarily to to treat those diseases. But now, because we really have the tools to be able to analyze cancers and identify those driver pathways, we can take these drugs that were approved for use in lung cancer, say, and use them in breast cancer, or breast cancer drugs and use them in bladder cancer, because they have the same pathways. So that becomes really personalized. And, and Purdue is involved in that in some unique and different ways, and I'll tell you something about that today. So the Moonshot Initiative was launched by President Obama, and he put Vice President uh, Biden in charge of that. And it's fantastic to have someone who can oversee this process and who has the power to really help bridge problems as they arise. And the, the initiative is launched to lower barriers, to bring people together, to provide resources, to enable us to move much, much faster and that's exactly what Purdue will do. We are primed. We're one of only 69 uh, National Cancer Institute designated cancer centers in the country. And we're a bit unique because we are one of only seven basic science centers. So we're in a very prestigious group, and we're very proud of our contributions uh, in that group. And I'll show you some of those uh, in a couple of minutes. So we build strength really through bringing faculty, very diverse faculty, together. We have 19 different part departments represented in our center. So we bring these people together with very diverse expertise. And as David was saying, that's what it takes to really get things done. And we work with Simon Cancer Center all the time. We beat them on the football field, but we work with them uh, in the cancer-related research activities. So they're our partners. And we, as a basic science center, really build the tools that enable them to treat the patients. So we, we fit hand in glove and work very strongly together on a regular basis. And, I, and Purdue, as an institution, has resources that enable us to do really fantastic things. One of them is the supercomputer. Uh, this computer is among the fastest in the country. And it enables us to utilize really huge databases uh, in a way that we couldn't do several years ago. 
So at, a, at one point in time, we used to analyze an intact tumor and, and try to draw conclusions from an integrated, diverse set of cancer cells. But today, we can actually analyze single individual cells within the tumor. And we analyze individual cells, many of them, and that generates just a ton of data, more than you can actually analyze. And we have nodes in the supercomputer that allow us to really get this work done. And without it, we'd be sitting around twiddling our thumbs waiting on the data to come in. So it's really fantastic that Purdue invests in that type of resource that puts us uh, you know, at the top of the list and enables us to do these kinds of studies. So we are a basic science center. So everything starts for us at the very basic level. We want to understand what makes a cancer cell a cancer cell. What are those driver pathways? And so Michael Went, a young investigator uh, in <clears throat> our center, is focusing on breast cancer. So breast cancer, if it's a localized nodule, you can surgically remove that. But the lethal form of that disease is a disease that spreads to other sites. And so Michael is trying to understand the driver pathways that make those cells leave the breast and go to the brain or go to the lung or go to the bone. And when we understand that, then we can develop therapeutics to block the process. And that's exactly what Purdue is all about. And <clears throat> David Nolte and John Turek have developed a very unique system uh, interferometry-based uh, dynamic in, in, imaging, and don't ask me what it is. I don't know. Maybe David knows. He's an engineer. Uh, but I know what the outcome is, and this is getting Purdue into the personalized medicine arena. So right now, if you're diagnosed with advanced cancer and you undergo chemotherapy, the way they tell whether or not you respond is to give you a round of chemotherapy bring you back for further imaging. If that tumor shrinks, you're responding. That takes a month or more. What is being developed by David and John is a way to do it prospectively, do it before you ever take chemotherapy. They can analyze a biopsy specimen and determine whether or not it's sensitive to the cancer. And it's all about cellular motion. They can see the cells move, the internal parts of the cell. And you see in the top level there, the cells look the same whether they're treated or not. So they're not sensitive. But those cells that really get upset, and you see that motion going crazy, uh, that's the way I understand the process. They, uh, <clears throat> that's the one you want to treat with. So you can start the right way and not delay, not lose a month. Fantastic. It's been validated. Our College of Veterinary Medicine has spontaneous cancers in pet animals and dogs. And we have analyzed those dogs. And nine of 10 cases using this technology have predicted accurately uh, the outcome. So it's really, really robust. And uh, the company was formed, Anodyne. And they just raised $1.7 million to start their first clinical trial. So we're really moving this forward. It's part of uh, Purdue's technology transfer process, and we are really making things happen. Now, Phil Lau has developed targeted delivery of therapeutics. You see this little uh, compound that's, that's uh, shown on the screen. That black area is a synthetic compound that recognizes the cancer cell, and it recognizes it in a very specific way. Now, you can attach anything you want onto that targeting molecule. It's like a laser-guided missile. You've seen all that on TV, you know? The laser goes in, you see the little dot, and the <laughs> missile goes right in. Well, that's what we can do with this kind of therapy. But the interesting thing is it doesn't have to be a therapeutic attached. You can attach an imaging agent. And so you can image these cancers very, very efficiently. And I've got a little movie to show you what that's all about. If you'd start the movie, please. So that's Phil. And do you see those little green dots in there? That's the cancer. You don't see green anywhere else in this area. And you can't, the surgeon can't see it except under special light. 
and it identifies 100% of cancer. So if it lights up green, it's a cancer. And that shows you how specific it is and how we can deliver not only imaging agents, but also therapeutics. And interestingly, we can use it to get into immunotherapy. So Phil's very ingenious. So you, it, in immunotherapy, one of the one a very important approach to treating is modifying these killer cells in a way that you have uh, an arm on there that recognizes the cancer cell specifically. And as soon as that cell, that killer cell, attaches to the targeted tumor, it kills it. And that's how Jimmy Carter was cured. All right? So what Phil, there are problems associated with this kind of killer cell therapy. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of these targeted uh, receptors on the cancers are also expressed on normal cells. And these killer cells are very, very exquisitely sensitive to these targets. And we can't control them. Once they go in, they grow just like your own cells, and they will kill the normal cells. So that's a problem, and you can't control the rate of the response, which creates more problems. So what did Phil do? He used this technology right here. And what did he do? He said, well, I can develop that killer cell so that it attacks the imaging agent. Then I can put on any targeting agent I want to. So the black dot is the imaging agent, and the different colors represent different targeting compounds. He can put anything he wants, attack any tumor he wants. But the only time these cells will kill the cancer is when he puts in the compound. So you can put it in and activate the cells. You can take it away, and they don't kill anything because they have nothing to react with. So he's eliminated some of the major problems with this process. And this is moving forward very rapidly. We're very excited about it. This is just a diagram to show you that we have a lot of drugs being developed here. We're among the leaders in the country in drug development. We have 13 in clinical trials. You won't find many places that have that. But it's all dependent on our institutions' support, and they are supporting us in spades. They are investing. We have a new, uh, it's just changed its name. It used to be a center for drug discovery, but now it's an institute for drug discovery. Uh, so we have a new building for that. They've invested heavily in life sciences. There's $250 million investment in life sciences. As we understand the biology of these cells, we, un we develop new targets and so on. You can read what's in this, uh, this slide. But the bottom line is the institution is really supporting us as we move forward to conquer this disease. But we're not limited to therapeutic development. We also have technology. The engineers are really involved. We're making all sorts of new things. I told you about the interferometry, and you're going to hear about some of these other things from our scientists today. It's, uh, <clears throat> we're really engaged, and we're really going to speed this process up. Why do we do it? This is the real, the real reason. So we do it because patients are suffering, just like David's friend. Uh, we don't want them to be in that position. And there you see the numbers. There are a tremendous number, 35,000 Hoosiers who will be diagnosed. 13,000 of them are going to die this year. Nationwide, about 1.7 million are going to be diagnosed. And about 600,000 of them are going to die. That's, uh, that's a lot of people. And those are just numbers, though. Just look at your family. Your family has been affected, too. Mine has. <clears throat> My dad died at age 53, and he died of malignant melanoma. No treatment then, but if he were alive today and had that disease, he could be treated. He could be like Jimmy Carter. So that's why we do this. <clears throat> we do it so that people who develop this disease will not suffer. So thank you very much, and we'll move on to the next speaker. Dr. Radliff, thank you so very, very much. Impressive, impressive things going on. And, and in fact, 
We want to bring forward next a, a renowned researcher here at Purdue to tell us a little bit about uh, uh, his work and what, what he's doing. And would you please welcome Dr. Graham Cooks. Dr. Cooks is the Henry D. Hart Distinguished Professor of Analytical Chemistry. So I'm very pleased to be here this afternoon to talk to you about a little story on some events that have happened in our lab over the last uh, 12 years. The story has got two components. One of it is the making of new tools, which is something that boilermakers are good at and love to do. The second part of it is another thing that boilermakers love, which is chemistry. <laughs> I heard chemistry described by Tim Ratliff in a lot of different words. They were usually longer words. They were meant to camouflage the fact that a lot of the situation involving cancer is in fact chemistry. So a few years back, we were doing our normal sort of chemistry. We were trying to develop tools in order to identify molecules, in other words, chemicals. And we, we came across a method which worked in air, which is what we, well, we ordinarily breathe, so we like to work in air. We came across a method which was very fast, which is what we wanted, a method that gave us specific molecular chemical information in a few seconds. And we gave it a name because we give all our methods pet names, so we called it DESI because no one had called anything else DESI before. And so we have this DESI mass spec experiment that allowed us to do interesting things like identify whatever illicit drugs your children were using by taking a small sample of their urine and giving you that information which gave you power over your kids. But we wanted to do something more useful with it, and so we decided to try to apply this to the problem of cancer. So we looked at various kinds of cancers. We spent actually several of the intervening 12 years trying to find doctors that we could work with on this problem, because we have a method which identifies chemicals in, for example, tissue. And so if you take a bio, a, a small section, bio section, and use this DESI experiment, which is simply an extraction experiment, it's a liquid extraction experiment, you get a, a top, you get a set of markers which tell you something about that tissue. And so if we could do that experiment during surgery, we could in fact find out whether we were looking at tissue which was diseased or not diseased. So if we go to the slides, uh, we put together over a period of time a, a, a group of people and their names are here, their photographs are here. Uh, and the kind of cancer which is perhaps the, the most challenging of all is brain, uh, brain tumors. And some of the facts about brain tumors are given there. This is very similar to what Tim just told you, but this is the number of cases of brain tumors. It's the number of deaths in, in a year. Um, it also gives some statements about what's done at the moment. So the, the, the standard treatment, of course, is surgery. And there's not much more that can be done. And the information that's acquired during surgery is entirely optical, visual, and it's based on surgeon skills in terms of what they're going to do, and in particular, to what degree they're going to continue to resect. So during brain surgery, there is great opportunity, a great possibility of doing a great good, and there's also the possibility of doing great harm. And so the surgeon tends to be uh, very careful, very cautious about the resection process. But that's being done with tissue which is not easy to distinguish visually uh, between diseased and non-diseased. So the margins of the tumor are gradual. So what one really needs, this is what I say in this slide, is we need molecular information that tells us during surgery, on the time scale of surgery, so in other words, within a minute or two, what the state of that tissue is. And putting together then a, a team which consisted of a neurosurgeon, a neuropathologist, and the uh, postdocs and grad students shown here, we were able to tackle this problem. So what are we doing? We've got a tool. The tool then consists of this very simple device. On the left is the mass spectrometer, which records a pattern of intensities. So when you go to the grocery store and you buy stuff and you, you scan your item, what you're essentially doing is you're recording something completely analogous to a mass spectrum, and you're doing it in about the same amount of time as it takes to record a mass spectrum. So instead of recognizing the particular item that's going across the scanner, we're actually recognizing the molecular nature of this 
tiny section of tissue that's placed on the stage. And so what's happening in this experiment is a solvent is being directed at that tissue. This is like a spray from a spray bottle of some sort. That's on the, on the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, and it's extracting molecules. And those molecules are coming straight out of the tissue, and they represent uh, the disease state of that tissue. So within a minute or so, we can, in fact, determine uh, whether we're looking at diseased tissue, and if so, what's the disease, glioma? What's the grade of that glioma? Maybe it's a grade four glioma, grade three glioma. That information comes out automatically during, during the surgery. So it's the, the main problems in this, in this experiment are to not to do the science, because the science is easy. Uh, the main problem is to go through all the hoops that you need to do carefully in order to be able to do uh, medical science, which is appropriate. And so we have a, a, a partnership then with a, a group at IU School of Medicine, and this is the experiment that's being done. The photograph at the bottom is the neurosurgical suite at uh, IU, and the two people in that photograph are two grad students, uh, Clint Alfaro and Alan Garmush, who've been uh, leading this, this experiment. And what they have behind them is a mass spectrometer, which was built at Purdue and then is taken down to uh, the medical school, and it's sitting in the surgical suite. And the surgeon is the only one that's allowed to do surgery, and so they're not involved in that. But what they can do is run the mass spectrometer. And so the surgeon knows the question, is this region that I'm trying to decide whether or not to cut away, is this region cancerous or not? If it's cancerous, has it got a high percentage of tumor cell concentration or not? And the answer to that question now for the first time is available virtually instantaneously during the surgery. So, so far it's been all on the basis of the MRI image that's taken in advance of the surgery. No molecular information. If you have no chemical information while you're trying to make a decision as critical as do I cut away this part of a person's brain, you're in real trouble. And we've all been in real trouble and that's why there's so much recurrence of this disease. That's why two years later, most people are back again or else they've died of the disease. So there's some hope that this will make a difference. So what I show top left, this is for um, the, the spectroscopist like Nolte. Um, David, look top left, that's a mass spectrum. There's a ton of information in that. Uh, below that, another mass spectrum, completely different. And below that again, yet another. So that pattern that you're looking at there is gray matter, white matter, and glioma. And everybody in the room can look at those three spectra with knowing nothing about them, but they're different. And any time you see that spectrum at the bottom, you've got glioma. And the amount of material that you've got is, a, is much, much less than a milligram. You put it on a glass slide, and you take it 30 seconds to obtain this information. So you do that experiment 600 times and plot out the data in a different form where there's one dot that corresponds to each of those tissue sections, and you get that distribution where red corresponds to 200 gliomas, green corresponds to 200 gray matter, and uh, blue corresponds to 200 white matter samples. Now you do a new experiment. So this was setting up the library. Now you actually go into the surgery. You've got a, a patient. The information in the middle is the MRI. The MRI says there's a massive tumor in the brain. The surgeon knows that, goes in, knows that information. The question remains, what do you do? Where is the margin of that tumor? And so we show here two mass spectra. On the top left, there's a mass spectrum which is taken from the margins of the tumor. At the bottom is a, a spectrum which is taken right in the middle of the tumor. And you can see how dramatically different they are, and those are then interpreted in terms of those color maps, those PCA plots that I showed you. And so this information is available within seconds. The mass spectrometer is not an expensive instrument. In fact, we build them in the chemistry department at Purdue. Uh, and it doesn't require a lot of training. So the, the obstacles in, in this sort of race, in this moonshot, they're, they're severe, but they're mostly in terms of coordination. They're mostly in terms of putting me in touch with the right surgeon at the right time and having the right number of patients. And we can publish a full study and, and, and launch this methodology completely within a very short period of time. But those are big obstacles in terms of making the connections. That's where we are. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Dr. Cooks. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Debbie Knapp. She's the Dolores L. McCall Professor of Comparative Oncology and also the Director of Purdue's Comparative Oncology Program. Dr. Knapp. Thank you very much. It's a, a privilege to uh, be with you all this afternoon for this exciting uh, venture. Most of you in the room probably know this, but dogs also get cancer. Pet dogs do. In fact, the National Cancer Institute estimates that six million new pet dogs develop cancer every year. And why do we care about that? I can speak for myself. The reason I care about that is number one, I have appreciated animals through my whole life, and I could be classified as an animal lover. Two is, I'm a veterinarian, and specifically, I'm a veterinary medical oncologist. And three is, I'm a cancer researcher. So at Purdue, we are tackling the pet animal cancer problem with uh, tremendous energy. In fact, I am convinced that the team of people that I have the privilege to work with are doing more to advance this field than anyone. So on the slide here, our clinical team is in the, the photograph on the lower right. Um, our lab team is equally talented, uh, unfortunately aren't in the photo. And so every day, a parade of pet dogs walks in our door, and they are here for us to diagnose, to stage, and to treat their cancer. And we obviously want to make every one of them better and provide them with the best life that we can. But there's more to the story than that. If we look at human cancer research, and we specifically look at human clinical trials, over the last several years, unfortunately, about nine out of every 10 human clinical trials that has been done has failed. Either the drug doesn't work, it doesn't hit the right target, or the side effects are just impossible. And one of the reasons that those trials fail is the work that's gone into the research leading up to that trial has been done in model systems that may not mimic the human condition. So where pet dogs enter this picture is specific forms of cancer in pet dogs very, very, very closely mimic human cancer. And this is important because today there are greater demands on animal models for cancer than there have ever been before. We need immunocompetent models because we're moving into the immunotherapy realm. We need models where the molecular signatures and the mutations and the patterns of gene expression are the same between the dogs, between the animal model and the people. And so this is where dogs come in. I think that Purdue is better positioned than any university in the country to marry comparative oncology work in dogs and human cancer research. Why do I believe that? There has actually been a comparative oncology effort at Purdue since 1979. What that means is there's been a group of people that studies naturally occurring cancer to find out which forms mimic the human condition. And then they do studies in dogs with those cancers to learn things to help dogs and to help people. It's really a win, win, win. And I hope none of you have the wrong idea about what pet animal cancer research is about. Essentially, we do clinical trials. Pets are brought to us because they have cancer or they probably have cancer and they don't have a lot of options. And so we often enroll the dogs in clinical trials. They continue to live at home. They're happy pets. They see us periodically for treatment and evaluation. We expect every dog to benefit. We know they have the chance to benefit. We expect their treatment to be well tolerated. And we know we'll learn things that not only help that dog, but other dogs, and that get translated into people. At Purdue University, the Center for Cancer Research has been one of the most pioneering NCI-designated cancer centers out of those 69 that Dr. Ratliff mentioned. Because at Purdue University, the College of Veterinary Medicine and the Cancer Center are better integrated than anywhere in the country and probably anywhere in the world. If you look at the photo in the upper left, this is the Cancer Center leadership team before the last site visit. 
Three of the faculty members in that photo have their home in the College of Veterinary Medicine. And Dr. Ratliff has always, always been forward thinking and saying, what are our strengths and how can we build on those? And so we are extremely fortunate to be here. In the College of Veterinary Medicine, we don't have a particularly big cancer team. We have incredibly talented people at every level of our team, from volunteers, technicians, students, residents, all the way through the faculty. But we're not a very big team. So we realize we have to focus. And we have chosen to focus on three cancers. Uh, my passion is in urinary bladder cancer. Uh, you, I'll tell you in a minute why I'm holding a Scottish Terrier. My colleague Mike Childress, who is here today, leads the efforts in lymphoma. And in the picture on the right, he and Dr. Mark Cushman are observing a dog that's receiving a drug that was developed in Mark's lab that went into a canine trial. And that canine trial has influenced the decision to put that drug in a phase two human trial. And then on the lower right, my colleague Tim Bentley leads the efforts in brain cancer in the College of Veterinary Medicine. And then the map on the left, people seek us out from all over the country because they know in these areas we are a center of excellence. And each little, each little uh, tab shows you a state where people have traveled from to bring their dogs with cancer. So what can we accomplish? I think that Tim mentioned, you know, where, where can we really do the most in cancer research right now? If you were to ask me, I would list four areas. Number one is prevention. Number two is targeted therapies. Number three is immunotherapies. And number four would be repurposing drugs that we already have. So on this slide, this is sort of a map of where we're going with dog bladder cancer. So in the upper left, we talk about prevention. Well, if you want to prevent cancer, it helps to know what causes it. So pretty much any cancer is due to a combination of what the individual is born with, what do they inherit from their parents, and what are they exposed to during their lifetime. So if you want to track that in people, and you want to track lifetime exposure, okay, you're settling in for a 60 to 100 year study. None of us want to do that. So let's say, okay, let's just focus on maybe the 15 to 20 critical years of exposures in people and see what influences their cancer risk. Okay, so who wants to wait until the year 2035 to know the results of that study? Well, guess what? You can do that same study in dogs in two to three years. So you can have that information in 2019, and you can have that information in 2035, or ideally, you use the information from the dog to then plan the longer study in people. Also, what do we inherit that puts us at risk? We in the scientific community have probably identified about 5% of the things that people inherit that put them at risk. And we need to find those other 95% of things. And this is where dogs help us because of the breed risk. Scottish Terriers are 20 times more likely to develop bladder cancer than mixed breed dogs. So we can study their genetics, we can find out why that happens, and then we can go look for those factors in people where we know where to look because people are so diverse, it's hard, to, it's hard to fish these things out. Not only that, but now that you know dogs that are in high-risk breeds, those are the subjects for your prevention trials. And we're doing that right now. We're doing a three-year study in Scottish Terriers, and it's focused on screening, early detection, and early intervention. This is going to cover a time period that would take you 20 years in people. And we're halfway through that study, and the results are blowing me away looking at dogs that have no symptoms of cancer, and yet it's there, and yet it's, we're finding it, and we're stopping it before the dog ever knows they have anything wrong with them. So it's really cool. And then on the treatment front, of course, we are looking at targeted therapies. We're moving into immunotherapies, and we're characterizing this disease. Tim mentioned that one of the key things in human cancer right now is that, let's say there are 10 people sitting in this room. One has lung cancer, one has breast cancer, one has prostate cancer, one has bladder cancer. Well, if they have the same molecular abnormalities in their cancers, even though those, those cancers started in different parts of the body, they may benefit from some of the same drugs. Well, one of the really intriguing things about dog bladder cancer, this was discovered a couple of years ago 
in a collaboration between our group and Dr. Elaine Ostrander's group. And what we discovered is that 80 percent or more of dog bladder cancer has a very, very, very precise mutation that drives 8 percent of all human cancer across cancer types. So now not only do we have a model for bladder cancer, we have a model for BRAF-driven cancer, the mutation that drives 50 percent of human metastatic melanoma. So I, am in, I cannot tell you how excited I am to come to work every day because we are poised to do things that even five years ago I never dreamed would be possible. And it's not just here. The whole country, the National Cancer Institute, is recognizing the value, the value of dog studies. And Purdue has been doing this longer, and Purdue can do this better than anybody else, I have no doubt. So thank you. Appreciate it. Great. Dr. Knapp, thank you so very, very much. And now for our final research presentation, will you please welcome Dr. Ji Shin Cheng. Dr. Cheng is a professor of biomedical engineering and chemistry. Welcome. Thank you, Mark. So I'm happy to be here uh, to present our research along this uh, spectroscopic imaging for towards precision medicine. My group study a very basic question, that is how we utilize the nutrition, but at the single cell level. We call this single cell metabolism, especially we call this cancer metabolism. We study how the metabolism is different between the cancer cells and normal cells, and how we can use this difference for diagnosis and treatment. We enable this by using this called intrinsic signals from molecular spectroscopy. Here we call the chemical bond of vibration. This produces uh, molecular fingerprints. So this allows the molecular imaging in living cells, like C. elegans, protein synthesis, and also for diagnosis in skin cancer, heart disease, and the brain tumor. Compared to a label-based fluorescence microscopy, a key advantage of our label-free approach is that we can directly study a human patient specimen and make a discoveries under our device. In a recent paper, this published in Cell Metabolism two years ago, this is a teamwork between Purdue and the IU School of Medicine. We found this metabolites called cholesterol ester in aggressive human prostate cancer. So I show you one picture here. This is a stimulant image of uh, prostate cancer cells. These very bright droplets here are leopard droplets. And we found that more than 80% of molecules are cholesterol olate, a single molecule. So this opens two opportunities. One is for molecule-based diagnosis of aggressive prostate cancer. And the other one is for uh, this molecule-based or metabolism-based treatment of aggressive cancer. We know that the, the prostate cancer, only a few percent are aggressive, and then most of them are benign and can be left without treatment. But the current histology cannot tell this difference. So over-treatment is a big problem in prostate cancer therapy. And we hope that our metabolic marker can be used for early diagnosis of this aggressive prostate cancer. And on the direction of treatment, in a very recent paper we published in Oncogene early this year, we found that by targeting this cholesterol metabolism, we can stop not only the cancer growth, but also the spread of cancer metastasis. So this, is, this paper is on the uh, pancreatic cancer. This is a very deadly disease. The five-year survival rate is less than 5%. We show that by blocking the cholesterol ester formation, we can actually uh, stop the growth and the spread of pancreatic cancer to remote organs. In the very recent study uh, that is still uh, ongoing, we found another big uh, discovery between the cancer stem cells and non-stem cells. We know that the cancer stem cells form tumors in the body. By this hyperspectral imaging here, we found 
that uh, this lipid desaturation is significantly different between the cancer stem cells and non-stem cell in human ovarian cancer. So this is a collaboration with Daniel Metti, who provides us the human patient specimen. This is a well-controlled process at the single cell level. It's called the level lipid synthesis and uh, desaturation. So now we found a new target. We block the final step of this pathway called lipid desaturation. By doing this, we can block the cancer stem cells to form sphere. This is exactly the function of cancer stem cells. And if we treat the tumor cell with this desaturated inhibitor and then put the tumor cell in the mice, we see a big difference. The treated cells they don't form tumor anymore as compared to controlled tumor. So by this, we have discovered new marker for cancer stem cell detection and for cancer stem cell specific therapy. Along the direction of diagnosis, my group invented a new technology we call the listening to chemical bond of vibration. So this is a couple of the vibrational spectroscopy with ultrasound imaging technology so that we can gain depth, volume, and the chemical information together. So this allowed in vivo chemical imaging with sufficient penetration depth and sufficient field of view for quantitative analysis. We initially applied this to heart disease by making the caster we can detect the lipid deposition in the blood cell wall. This is for detection of vulnerable plaque. Since then, we uh, found a new company called uh, Vibronics. This is for vibration-based imaging technology for better treatment and a better diagnosis. The company recently uh, produced the first product we call it margin pad. This is for non-pachnomy. This is a very important surgery in the United States. So for partial removal of the tumor inside the breast. But the surgeon need to know that whether this removal is complete or not. So our machine can scan the entire surface within five minutes and tell the surgeon whether this removal is complete or not. This will significantly improve the survival rate and reduce the reoperation rate. We have made a transportable device on the wheel and we move this to IU School Hospital. So these are two of my students are doing this uh, clinical study in IU School Hospital in collaboration with Linda Hong, a surgeon in uh, IU School of Medicine. So far we have studied uh, more than 60 patients from tissue bank and more than 40 patients in the surgical room. So I just hear that uh, this cancer moonshot could uh, uh, facilitate the FDA approve, uh, approval process. Our goal is get this device to be FDA approval next year, and we hope that in the near future, this kind of technology can really help the human cancer patients. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chang. How about a special round of applause for all these great researchers? We appreciate your innovation and your tireless work. Thank you so much. Cancer is a mean disease. Nobody knows that better than someone who has b battled the disease herself. But cancer was no match for our friend Terry Kicks. Terry is a survivor. She's the director of operations for Purdue Women's Basketball, and she's here to tell us a story. Come on up, Terry. Thank you, Mike, and uh, it is an absolute honor to be up here today sharing my story with you all. Um, special thank you to Tim and to Dave for their leadership, and wow, to hear, to hear the researchers and what they're doing, um, it really is amazing, um, and they're saving lives. Everybody in this room collectively is saving lives, and I am, for, I am very fortunate and blessed to be one of those. Um, there are millions of cancer patients and fighters out there as we speak, and uh, I'm honored to share my story in, in hopes that we can continue to help others. Um, I was diagnosed about four years ago with um, advanced stage three stomach cancer. 
Um, it was a very bleak diagnosis. Um, you know, one of my first appointments with my medical team, I was pretty much told I had statistically, that's an important word, statistically, because they didn't, they didn't know uh, me and my support team and my, my, my Purdue family very well, but they, I was told I had about a 10% chance to live, statistically. So, you know, when you go from being a very active, um, I, you know, I was very, uh, really never had been sick much at all. I'm a very healthy, I've been an athlete my whole life. Um, to getting a diagnosis like that that just sends shock waves, as you can imagine, throughout your whole body, and you, you, you really can't explain that feeling when someone diagnosed you with the big C word. Um, so, went with that diagnosis and uh, we went into fight mode, but I have to tell you that the, the thing that really saved my life is the research. The research that's being done uh, and, and the strides that are being made. Um, I was very fortunate that within my medical team was able to find out that I, was, I had this, the gene or the cell, the HERS2 uh, receptor. So basically, that is something that they use in breast cancer quite a bit um, for treatment. But um, probably five years before my diagnosis, they realized that the HERS2 treatment, the chemo treatment for, with the HERS2 also was like a cousin to stomach cancer. So I basically, um, we went with the, the, the process of um, having the HERS2 really going after and, and, and treating my, my type of tumor. So my treatment was, um, it was a, uh, a three-week process, and I had six rounds of treatment. I had three cocktails, and the last cocktails was, was for the actual HERS2 treatment. So I basically uh, went a week with having four cocktails throughout my body from eight in the morning. I went in at eight in the morning for my infusions, and I was the first one in, the first one to leave. I was there to six o'clock. So from eight in the morning to six o'clock, was my treatment. And then the last part of the treatment, I had a little bag that dripped for the whole week. So I went for a whole week with treatment. I had a week of not feeling very well. I had a week to recover. And I did it start all over again. So we did that six times. And I was told I was, give it, was given enough chemo to kill a 280 pound man. And I can tell you that uh, that's pretty, probably pretty true. Um, you know, I, I, by the, what happens with the chemo treatments is it accumulates. So, you know, I went down, but by, by my last treatment, I was probably down to 115 pounds. Um, it was bringing me to my knees, my last round of treatment, when I had my, my week of tough time, I felt like I had the worst, and I'm sorry for any students in here, but probably the worst hangover in my life for eight days straight. That's really what it felt like, but that was the end of that last treatment. Um, but what, what happened was this beautiful uh, chemo for the HERS attacked my stomach tumor. It went from five centimeters, a very large tumor in my stomach, to about the size of a dime. And so I was able to have laparoscopic surgery, and they took the tumor right through my belly button. I didn't have to get cut open. Um, I'm here to tell you I eat just as well as I ever did today. Um, I, I went very, I was able to uh, have surgery, um, have everything taken care of, and um, I was, my surgeon was, I had surgery at Sloan Kettering in New York with the top stomach cancer surgeon in the world. And um, after my surgery, she came bouncing in, she was kind of doing cartwheels, and I, I didn't understand the excitement at the time, but she explained to me that she had done over 20,000 stomach sur gastro surgeries, and I was one of only five people in the world that was 100% cancer-free. So, <laughs> what they're doing here is working. And now I am, you know, I go back, uh, I had all my chemo treatment right here locally. 
I go back to Sloan Kettering every six months and part of their research, and we are saving lives. We are saving lives, and it started right here at Purdue. So, you know, um, I, I just, just listening to what the presenters talked about, I mean, and, and, and the leadership with Tim, um, great things are happening. Great things are happening. We have all been touched. We all have loved ones. We have families. We have friends. We have people fighting right now. Um, we've got, we have to continue to contribute. We have to do whatever we can to support the initiatives here um, because it matters. It matters. And I, I don't want to get emotional. I try not to get emotional. But I would, I really, I would not be here I would not be in front of you right now if it wasn't for what is going on here, right here, right here at Purdue. So thank you, everybody. Let's keep doing it. Let's knock it out. And, uh, you know, I have, I have a four-letter word for cancer that I can't say right now, but you all know it, all right? You all know it. Thank you. Terry Kicks, what an inspiration that lady is. Thank you so much. Well, I hope you've learned what incredible things are happening right here in your community and are inspired to find ways that you can help double the progress in cancer research. Our afternoon isn't quite over yet. Will you please take the opportunity to talk to those around you and to visit with our researchers that we have around, that are gonna be all around the room. And the topic of their research is in your program, so uh, if you'd like to take a look, there are spaces set up around the, uh, around the atrium area here, and you can find more about what's taking place right here at Purdue. And I'd like to ask Dr. Ratliff to take over the microphone again and get set us on our way. I just want to thank everybody for coming. It's uh, a pleasure for us to show you some of the things we're doing. We have 102 members. So you multiply what you saw today by 100. That's what's going on at Purdue. So you see on the screen uh, our website. Please visit the website. Please learn more about our uh, center and the many things that we're doing. And we have posted on the website uh, Vice President Biden's speech from this morning. And if you're interested in seeing that, and uh, Please go to our site and you can take a look. So again, thank you and please do visit around and talk to various people uh, and have some refreshments. So we have that over there for you too. Thank you very much. <laughs>